Hi, Franco Cavallari coming to you from Biologic. I'm gonna talk a little bit about protein and the trend, which is well into its trend stage. Plant-based proteins versus animal sourced proteins and biological value. Let me qualify biological value real quick. I talk a lot about biological value of protein in Potential Within and how it relates to athletes and demand for protein building blocks on the basis of development as well. So biological value is a measure given to a protein source based on the nitrogen contribution it gives the body when you consume it. The nitrogen is a function of each amino acid. Every amino acid has an amine group, nitrogen. And so we can measure the nitrogen going in versus the nitrogen coming out. So what the nitrogen excreted from the body after measuring the nitrogen going in is a measure when you subtract the excreted component of what your body retains. So the retained nitrogen <clears throat> is, it helps us qualify the quality of a protein in the context of your biological system. It has nothing to do with amino acid profile and what we think is good for you. It's about the context of the biological system uh, in vivo, meaning what you consume versus what you excrete is what you keep in the body in the context of recovery and retention of tissue. And one of the reasons why bodybuilders, powerlifters, <clears throat> athletes looking to optimize physical mass and or strength, one of the reasons why they like whey protein, whole eggs, is because they have a high biological value. High biological value. Everything was measured in the past around whole egg. Whole egg was kind of like it was the reference point, 100. So a biological value of 100 was like, whoa, that was the best thing. But then came whey. And whey protein, when processed properly, not always the same, but let's just keep it simple. When processed properly, can exceed 100. And whey proteins that you buy in the marketplace, the commercial stuff that you might buy in the health food store, it'll range between biological value of 90 to about 110. And it can actually go higher for medical ways that are used to, to treat burn victims and things like that. So let's back up and look at these different sources. I talk a lot about uh, biological value in here again, and I list each of these protein sources so you know how they rate in terms of biological value. Now, if you're sedentary and sitting around, uh, it doesn't really matter how high the biological value is because demand for protein by the body is low. In your developmental stages, demand is high. Now, if you take developmental stages and couple it to intense physical activity like weight training, uh, basketball, someone working out, you know, two hours a day plus school, plus developing, wow, protein demand by the body goes up. Meaning quantity is important, but the quality needs to be high in order for the body to extract what it needs so you can recover from day-to-day -day physical work and maintain the strength uh, that you need to proceed throughout your physical day. This is why bodybuilders and athletes who are intense are looking for high biological value protein. And in comes plant-based proteins. And the plant-based proteins can serve a lot of people, but I gotta tell you, I'm of the belief, based on the research, based on personal experience, that the plant-based proteins can't get to a biological value that's high enough to meet demand if you are amongst the top three or 4% of athletes who are competing at levels that are beyond the average. For the average person and most people, plant-based proteins are fine. But what you have to make sure you keep in mind with plant-based proteins is that you combine the type of protein with the other type of protein. I'll explain what that means in a moment because it's vague to combine the limitations that legumes, legumes can be very high in essential amino acids called, like say for example, lysine, but very low in tryptophan and other amino acids that are essential for the body that are not available abundantly in that legume or pea protein for instance, but has to be combined with a cereal protein at the same time in order to optimize the profile of those amino acids so they can fit into the profile, the sequence of amino acids needed to build tissue. I gotta tell you, if one amino acid is missing in the sequence of that tissue that you're trying to rebuild, only one, all of the protein you consumed is discarded because that tissue cannot be rebuilt. That sequence of amino acids is critically essential. Okay, very specific to the tissue. That's why high biological value proteins 
tend to be designed to supply the amino acid profile in a form and in a ratio that fits biological recovery. And so then we have to manually combine pea protein, for instance, and rice protein, the cereal protein and the legume to offset the limitations that each would have. And it works for most people. I, I give my kids and I myself also, I use whey protein, whole egg. Let me give you some numbers, okay, to give you an, an idea. Whole egg, again, has a biological value of 100. Whey protein can exceed 100. Most legumes are between 49 and 55. So it gives you an idea, a relative idea of the biological value. Soy protein can be as high as 75 or so. However, soy has another feature that might be problematic for some, and that is the isoflavone. Now the isoflavone has estrogenic activity. Now this is misunderstood completely. It's another subject matter altogether. Isoflavones tend to be estrogenic, but when they bind to the receptor of an estrogen receptor, the activity of that estrogenic compound is mild. It's very low. It's not something we really have to worry about as adults because as adults, we have already developed hormonally to female or male hormone profiles. And therefore the high estrogen, the biological estrogen in the woman is not gonna be affected adversely by the isoflavones in the soy. And the same for, for men. But in children that are in developmental stages, it can be an issue because the estrogen to testosterone ratios have not yet developed and that mild estrogenic activity can have an influence. Now in adults, the influence is actually positive because it, it actually helps to offset and limit the effects of biological estrogen. And therefore, indirectly, I don't wanna make any claims, but theoretically, if you have an estrogen-related cancer, for instance, that isoflavone can bind to the estrogen receptor and serve as an antagonist, it's called, meaning such a mild effect, not allowing the biological estrogen to bind, okay? Outside of that, let's move away and talk about protein, because that's the subject matter. How much protein do you actually need? If you're in high demand of protein because you're in developmental stages, plus you're in levels of activity that are beyond that of uh, the average. And I, I would put my, my son in that category, so I watch this. I always suggest for him one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. That's a lot to get out of food. It's like 170 grams of protein a day for him, up to 175. I myself, you know, I weigh about 190 and I try to stay around 150 grams of protein per day because I'm not trying to build, I'm trying to maintain. But the biological value has to be high. For me as a 57 year old man working out and trying to stay fit, the digestion of protein has declined as you get older. And so the biological value has to get high enough to offset that so that you can maintain lean muscle. Lean muscle is critical for health. You lose lean muscle, and it's a marker, a biological marker for your state of health and your capacity to be resilient to disease. And protein is the building block. Protein is in reference to life, to teen component. So protein is critical. Now, as you consume protein in your daily meals, the higher the carbohydrate content, the lower the protein needs to be, so to speak. So carbohydrate intake creates a protein sparing effect for the body so the body doesn't take your protein and use it as an energy source, you see? So you can take a high protein content, low carbohydrate content, the body will convert a lot of those amino acids, they're called gluconeogenic amino acids, into carbs so that it can use those as energy sources. But if you try and maintain a level of carbohydrate to protein in your diet, protein, carbohydrate, to give you the carb load you need for energy and fats. Please don't avoid fats. Fats are critical, more critical than carbohydrate. In fact, as we lower carbohydrate intake, we should be increasing fat. But if you actually lower carbohydrate intake uh, and have protein intake too high without fat, then the, carb, the protein will be converted into carbs. So that's just some reference points and things to think about. But please do not limit protein intake for these kids that are working hard in school, in sport, and still in developmental stages because they need to maintain that skeletal muscle while in developmental stages, while in recovery from training. And again, the many of those amino acids are also building blocks and fuels that serve the, the immune system. Protein's critical.